Good morning, Forefront. My name is Juby Williams. I'm so happy to be here today. Um, we've been in our uh, Powers and Principalities series where we were looking and taking a look at the structures and systems that have influenced us in our, in our faith. And I have an opportunity to share about my personal history and my culture's um, history in terms of uh, Christianity. So I am a Malayali Christian. I am Malayali because I'm from the state of Kerala of, in South India and I speak Malayalam so we call ourselves Malayalis. You know I came to this country with my family, with my sister and my mom and dad um, in the early 80s we immigrated to the United States and we had a people that had brought us some relatives and some other family that had brought my mom about nine months before we arrived and so she set up um, just a little bit more of an established life before bringing my, my dad and me and my sister over to this country. And we settled in the um, in North Philadelphia, in the Albany section of North Philly. We knew, because my mom had been here and from other Malayalis, that um, that neighborhood that we settled in wasn't going to be our forever home. Um, we knew that you know, all the black and brown folks that lived around us, uh, we'd be leaving them soon because um, the American dream, the myth of the American dream and the myth of the model, model minority was ingrained in us. Uh, we knew that if we worked hard enough and if we um, saved money, we could move out of that Albany section of North Philly and move to the suburbs. And my parents actually did that. They worked for seven years. Um, and they uh, did double shifts and they saved all their money so that we could follow that myth that to get to that single family home in the white suburbs. So we moved there when I was about nine. Um, and, you know, these ideas of hierarchy, um, of the position of power, were really familiar to my family. Um, we are well versed in hierarchy, uh, being Indians. You know, the caste system in India is the ultimate example and proof of segregation and distinction, class distinction. You know, Hindus in India, um, through religion and culture, have this caste system where um, the castes are not allowed to ma like mingle or um, have any relationship with each other because they believe that the lower caste polluted the upper caste so that there's um, if a lower caste person talked to an upper caste person then that upper caste person would be damaged in some way. Um, this is a rigid system of regulations and rules that oppressed lower castes and gave privilege to the upper castes. Um, so, you know, I won't go into actually listing all of the different names for the cast because honestly I can't pronounce all of them, but um, I will talk about two of those castes. The first caste that's actually relevant to my history are the Brahmins. They are the highest caste. And there's another caste that um, uh, I would like to talk about. They're actually out of the four caste system. In Kerala, the state I'm from, they have much more um, defined terms for each caste, like, and even within the caste, they have different segregations. Um, but these people are called the untouchables or the Dalits. They're outside of that four caste system. So I'm going to talk about the Brahmins and I'm going to talk a little bit about the Dalits. Um, so, you know, when I track my, um, the history of Christianity in, in, in Kerala, in my state for Malayalis, I learned a lot of uh, things I, di I didn't know about before. One of the things was that, you know, in all of India's population, um, there's only 2% Christian, and most of that population is in Kerala from the state, and that's because of the conversion of Christians there. So in, it's said to believe that the first Christians that were converted in, in Kerala was in 52 AD by St. Thomas, Jesus' disciple. 
Um, you know who St. Thomas is. He's doubting Thomas. He's the one where when Jesus was resurrected from the dead and went to his disciples, doubting Thomas came up to him and was like, who are you? I don't believe you're the Christ. And so Jesus had to show him the scars in his hands for Thomas to believe him. So I often say, you know, you know, I make a joke that the foundation of my Christianity was built on doubt, you know, from doubting Thomas. Um, so anyway, the, you know, it's we're, we believe, it's said, that St. Thomas came to the Malabar coast and converted all the Brahmins there to Christianity. And those Brahmin converted Christians of St. Thomas were popularly known as Syrian Christians. And so the Syrian Christians, um, you know, I have some historical facts that I'm going to sort of read and let you know about what I learned. Um, they had inserted themselves within Indian caste society, and they kept, almost kept their, their Brahmin-like state and status. So they became Christians, but they still subscribed to that caste hierarchy. Um, they followed the same rules of the caste system, and they... They um, actually, because of their status and because of their conversion, the Hindus there uh, considered them as pollution neutralizers. I think that's the term, yes, pollution neutralizers. So that meant if someone from the lower caste wanted to give a Brahmin um, who was of upper, upper class some things, some substance or whatever, they would give it to the Syrian Christians first, and then the Syrian Christians would pass it over to the Brahmins. And then the Brahmins wouldn't be damaged or um, be polluted by having something from a lower caste person. Um, and um, historian Rajender Prasad, he said that the Syrian Christians actually took ritualistic baths to... Um, you know, depollute themselves or cleanse themselves from talking to, from touching these um, lower caste people. That's how much they subscribed to this hierarchy. They came in, they, they were converted, nothing changed about their power and position, and they kept their privilege. You know, so as I was uncovering more about, about our, you know, our state's c conversion to Christianity, I learned um, some other things that affected um, the segregation of the different churches and the Christianity there in Kerala. So let me go through this brief timeline so that I can sort of uh, show you a parallel. Um, so we know in 52 AD, St. Thomas uh, came to the Malabar coast, converted the Brahmins, the highest caste. And then those lower castes, were converted in the 16th century by St. Francis Xavier. And um, they were deemed as Latin Christians. Um, then the last group that was converted, the Dalits, and you know, I, I listed them as untouchable, but they really had no rights. They were enslaved, they were persecuted, they were, um, had oppressive rule over them, they, had not, they couldn't do anything other than be enslaved. Um, that those Dalits were converted to Christianity in the 19th century by the Anglicans and also in the 20th century by the Catholic Syrian Church. And these labels of Syrian and Latin, they only apply uh, and are relevant to our church history because of the way um, the language is in the uh, liturgies that we follow. So, you know, as these different castes were converted, you would think that the message of Christianity of love, of hope, of um, equality, of equity, of, of Jesus seeing the heart in the individual would actually be, you know, you would think that they would influence the Christianity, but that was totally opposite. Our Christianity was usurped by the caste system. Um, the hierarchy of the caste system in Christians, the Kerala Christians, still exists today. Um, you know, the Dalits were promised uh, change uh, of status. They were promised um, equitable practices and restoration of rights when they converted to Christianity. But you know, even to this day, they are ostracized from Kerala Christian community. Even to this day, they are oppressed because of their historical casteism. You know, there are many times in uh, researching and understanding my history and my church history that um, 
I was just brought to tears because of the repre reprehensible treatment that these Dalits faced and still face today. Um, I was saddened and I mourned the experiences of, you know, all the people in the caste system that were thought to be lower than others, um, especially the Dalit Christians who, who wanted liberation. They wanted to be free and that's why they adopted Christianity as their religion. They changed their religion as a group to be able to get freedom, but yet they were still marked by oppression. You know, growing up, I didn't learn all about these different types of Christianity or who was converted when. Uh, I learned that, that St. Thomas founded our church in 52 AD and all these other groups were never mentioned to me. We never talked about the experiences about these groups. We never fought for the inequity or the laws against them or anything to change their social distinction and caste distinctions. Growing up, I had, you know, few non-Malayali Martha my uh, Christian friends, um, and I had less exposure to Malayali Hindus. And so, you know, if you haven't figured it out, I am a Syrian Orthodox Christian from the Marthoma Church, St. Thomas Marthoma, that's what it means. So, you know, I didn't have exposure to any of these people. I didn't have a lot of exposure to Malayali Hindus. And my view of even Hinduism was um, influenced by, you know, saying that we believe in God, the one true God, and they, all the gods they believed with were deemed as demonic, you know? As I unpack this history of casteism, I see that the Syrian Orthodox Christians believed from the beginning that they were still of high caste and privileged. And that privilege historically was passed down to me. So I didn't have to concern myself with anybody else. I didn't have to learn about anybody else. You know, even in my own microcosm of culture, there's a hierarchy of color. Casteism promoted colorism. So, you know, if you are a lower caste, you did laborer jobs, you were out in the sun, you were darker. So like even to this day, many Malayali parents will tell their children, don't go out in the sun, you'll get dark. So, you know, I grew up hearing that and I never understood why, I, why my parents didn't really want me to be dark. I just thought they didn't think I looked good darker. Um, but I mean, everyone looks great darker. I mean, that's why people tan for hours and hours a day. Um, but, you know, in terms of understanding their viewpoint, like they really thought that me getting darker would devalue me, that I would be less than what I am if my skin became darker. You know, this point of colorism is so strong and it's so perpetuated by colonialism and the British rule. We have this, um, you might have heard of this, this skin lightening cream this bleach cream called Fair and Lovely. And I swear, I mean, I'm not a dark-skinned Indian. I'm not, you know, mo a lot of Malayalis are a little bit darker. And I was even, you know, wanted to be lighter. So I would use uh, Fair and Lovely very often growing up. You know, if you blindfolded me and you put beauty products in front of my face, I could possibly, I probably could pick out the Fair and Lovely cream just by the smell of how and how um, you know it brings back all those memories of familiar that familiar scent. So, you know, I was brought up with racism, with casteism, with colorism, and that manifested in my Christianity. Maybe you've experienced something really similar. Maybe you um, you, you remember stories about how your family or your church interacted with different people groups, with people of color, or even with white people. My siblings of color, what's your story? I know this has been an especially grueling time. How are you unpacking all these things? What is that process like? White siblings, how are you doing? How are you unpacking all these things? I know many of you have told me 
that you feel so much guilt and shame because of that privilege that you have. You have privilege and your black and brown siblings are dying. You know, I wanna tell you, it's okay to dig deep into understanding the truth about the history and see the interpretation of that history that our families presented to us. By uncovering these things, we get to uh, bring equity and challenge and break down the systems that uphold racial, class, and coloristic distinctions. You know, there's a myriad of reasons to do this. You know, we want to be equitable. We want to lift each other up. We want to decenter. But I also think one really great reason to do this is because God calls us as Christians to do this. I'm no theologian, and I really don't claim to be a preacher. Um, you have so many great preachers here at Forefront. But I will say that whenever I read scripture, Jesus always had a way of addressing the deepest need of an individual he was dealing with. So in Matthew 7, he's, you know, he's on the Sermon on the Mount. He's telling this tons and tons of people about a new law. You know, they had followed 613 laws just to be in favor with God. But Jesus says in verse 3 of Matthew 7, Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take that speck out of your eye, when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First, take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Okay, I know you know this story. Many of you have grown up in the church. You probably have heard it about in the context of not judging each other. You know, oftentimes you may make light of it, and you know, when you're pouring your third glass of wine or you're opening the fridge for that fourth beer, someone says, hey, isn't that your fourth beer? And you say, Take the plank out of your own eye, right? I mean, we've all done it. Um, but that's not what Jesus is really saying here. Let's take a closer look at what Jesus really means by what he says. Okay, so I learned that in the Greek, uh, sawdust is uh, moat. And when you translate moat, it's actually a speck of dust, a speck of sawdust in the eye. And the plank that Jesus is talking about is um, a beam in a rafter, so sort of like a support beam for a building. So that's a humongous, huge beam, a huge plank. So, you know, Jesus describes that smallness of the dust. Um, and, you know, if you get dust in your eye or sawdust in your eye, you know, I wear contacts. There's a lot of things that always happen and that irritate my eye. I mean, it ruins my day, but you know, I'm not going to the hospital because I have some dust in my eye. When you have a plank in your eye, this renders you blind. You know, it's not just ruining your day. You'd be close to death if you had a plank in your eye. And here's the biggest thing that Jesus was saying. I'm going to read this because I think it's really important. To have a plank in your eye is willfully ignoring the obvious. It's pretending that all is okay, or you have things figured out, or things aren't really what, what they seem, when in reality, you're going to die if you don't get this thing out. To have a plank in your eye is an overt acknowledgement that we'd rather walk around willfully obstructed rather than do the hard work of uncovering the multitude of communal sins passed down from our families, cultures, and communities. You know, Jesus didn't say it was wrong for us to help, help our brothers with the speck in his eye. It's actually a really a good thing to help your brother with the speck in his eye, but not before you take out that plank in your eye. If you don't recognize, build awareness, and I even say name that plank, name the log in your eye, it is in inevitable that you'll project hate or hate it el elsewhere. If you're willfully obstructed and unwilling to do your own work, you'll have no grace for anyone else. It's like walking down the street 
and you get mad at someone, you're like, oh my God, look at that person with that big plank in their eye. Meanwhile, you have the same obstruction in yours. It's why you get so angry at your Aunt Ruth on Facebook when you see that she says she's colorblind or she wonders why the statue should go down. You know, we're angry at Aunt Ruth um, because we're actually, in reality, angry at the, our families and, and, the, and the work that we haven't done of seeing how our family systems have perpetuated and fostered racism. The plank remains and were willfully obstructed. You know, my Latinx siblings talk to me a lot about the colorism. It's very um, similar in their cultures. You know, we're very quick to, to point out racism and talk about racism. And we, you know, we really will call it out anywhere. But it's really hard to confront that colorism in our own heritage and the history of that and why it is the way that it is. You know, it's the reason why we have those crazy conspiracy theories. There are so many conspiracy theories out there. Um, you know, it's way easier to believe that you know, there's a pizza place in Oregon that is uh, in cahoots with the Democratic Party and wants to destroy America, right? It's way easier to believe that 5G is getting us sick or the government is like tracking us with face masks. Um, it's way easier uh, to, you know, to believe the myth that you can pull yourself up from your bootstraps and you don't need any extra help. You know why this is all easier? Because believing these absurdities, you can conveniently forget that we are complicit in broken systems, that our family raised us in racist ways, and that we contribute to the brokenness in society. In short, we want to believe these conspiracy theories because they stop us from having to remove that big plank out of our eye. We get to stay willfully obstructed. We get to blame. We get to cast blame. You know, we cannot fight for the liberation of our black and black brown siblings without taking a look at how our families have been agents in their oppression. I can't fight for my black and uh, brown siblings without confronting the casteism and colorism in my own culture and fight for the rights of the most marginalized in my culture. I cannot fight for my LGBTQA plus siblings of color until I see how my culture has hidden, erased, and demonized them. I have to remove my plank first. So the Bible often talks about the sins of our forefathers, of our ancestors. And I didn't really get it until now. I think that I can see it clearly. Our unwillingness to unpack the sins of our ancestors creates the same sin in us. Now these are the powers and principalities that we must fight against. Here's what's encouraging. I know I've talked a lot about heavy things and hard things. You know, I think it becomes our privilege that every single one of us gets the opportunity to work on removing this plank. It's our privilege that we don't have to be blind, that we have access to resources and, and information and um, dialogue and exchange. Um, it's our privilege that we can confront these sins so they're not passed down. And if we really truly want to, we can work towards stopping this generational sin with us. You know, I can speak from my experience that unpacking all the ways that my Malayali community has hurt, abused, oppressed its own people is super painful. I feel shame. I feel regret. I feel ignorant. I feel privileged. But that shame doesn't have to define me. I don't have to embody that abuse. I don't have to embody casteism and wear it like an albatross around my neck. I get to change it. So that's what I want you to do today. I want us to know that we have this amazing opportunity 
to no longer, no longer be willfully obstructed by this plank. And you know what? I don't think we need to be afraid. Let's not be afraid of removing this monstrous obstruction. I invite you to do the work of unpacking racism and classism in your family and cultures. I invite you to research, to Google, to put yourself in situations where you uncover really painful truths. That's what I did in learning about my culture sins. I invite you to talk to your family and other people in your culture about this. You know, I've, I've been a part of this really great group on Facebook. It's called Maliali, um, Malialis for Black Lives. And this group is a safe space for us to lament our history, our racism, even the racism that is um, embedded in our language. It's uh, a group and a safe space for us to lament and share the experiences that we've had of racism against us as immigrants to this country. And we talk about the ways we've code switched to better assimilate to this country and to the values of this country or what's expected of, of us in this country. You know, it's all really healing, but it's also painful, but it's also very good. I invite you to do the same. You know, I even love that for Forefront to be this kind of space that's safe for you to share what's, what you're uncovering in your research and in, your, in talking with your family. Um, we have two really great group groups that we've started a while back, the decolonization group for people of color and white people, um, the white, I think it's called the white people group. <laughs> I don't know what it's called, <laughs> but it's for people who identify as white. Um, those two great spaces were, um, sort of designed to be able to unpack this stuff together, to question, to actually see and see how we can actually cite, uh, stop this cycle of oppression and stop the sins of our ancestors. You know, this isn't easy, and I have to be honest with you. Uh, there's many times throughout this process that I've just like broken down crying, like weeping, like my heart is heavy and there's a pain in my chest. Ending supremacy culture feels impossible sometimes. And, you know, to know that I'm a minority, that I'm a woman, I'm a person of color, I'm a victim of racism, you know, that's hard enough. But to know that I am complicit in those systems is even harder. But again, there's hope. We have, you know, Jonathan says this all the time, we have this really ridiculous, bold, audacious call to usher in the next 500 years of Christianity. And we and one of those, the biggest aspects of ushering that in is to end supremacy culture. We can do it. We can do it together. It's going to take a lot of digging, a lot of dialogue, a lot of um, introspection, but we can do it. So let's stop and recognize that we're willfully obstructed by these planks. And let's do the really hard, really good kingdom work that we're called to do by Jesus. Let's do the hard work of pulling out those planks and move towards liberation for us, for our families, and for others. Will you pray for me? With me? Pray with me and for me. Dear God, we thank you that in our brokenness you restore We thank you that we're not limited by our history, that you've created and created us as whole beings. God, give us the strength. Give us the hope. Give us the energy. Give us the peace as we work through all these hard things. God, help us to know that the shame, the embarrassment, the guilt, God, that those things are not of you. Help us to work on ourselves so that we can help others. Thank you 
for your ever, ever love, peace, and guidance. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.